Hello. Hi, is this Sam? That's me. All right. Well, let me do the official introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very excited and honored to welcome our featured guest for this evening. He is a cult movie maverick, in our opinion. He is a producer, a distributor, a writer, a director. He's done a little bit of everything. We're very excited to welcome the one and only Sam Sherman to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome, Sam. Hey, nice to be here with you and uh, looking forward to the show. Yeah. You know, I turn around and liken the listeners to the fact of you and your partner, Al Adamson, as yet another Nicholson and Arkoff. Would you say that's correct? I'd say it's a pretty good guess. <laughs> in fact, they were kind of session influenced. That's kind of where you got your production name from, right? Well, uh, I would say uh, we did it because we were raising money for the company, and we wanted a company that sounded like something people had heard of, and... Uh, the real original was Universal International, right. and then uh, along came American International. And we were an independent company. We said, why not Independent International? Wow. Right, right, for sure. Now, I wanted to start off, obviously we're going to talk about your films and things like that, Sam, but I wanted to start off by talking about this new memoir that you put out uh, just this just this past July. Uh, for all of our listeners who haven't heard about it, it's called When Dracula Met Frankenstein, My Years Making Drive-In Movies with Al Adamson. So tell us a little bit about the book and how or why did you decide to write the book and basically tell your story? Well, it had been something in the works all my career. Uh, Al and I had another partner, Dan Kennis, another partner, Erwin Pizer, and uh, a lot of crazy things would always be happening, and Dan Kennis would always say to me, uh, here's another story for your book. So I was always saving up a lot of crazy things and unusual stories that happen, figuring someday I would tell it. And uh, as time went on, and there were so many fans still remembering the movies, enjoying the movies, and uh, people would not get the story right. They'd come up with a, an idea from watching the films as to why the films were like they were. Mm -hmm. So I decided I'd better tell the story myself because this way I'll get it right. People will understand why some of our movies are as crazy as they are and uh, the whys and the wherefores and all that. And that's why I did the book. I guess you and Al never really realized how popu uh, popular you were. I know that Al certainly didn't to the fact that you wound up bringing him to a convention. You can tell everybody about that because he didn't realize how popular he was. But you yourself had said in this interview I saw that you used to criticize your films and the fans would get upset because they loved them so much. So you, you just realize, hey, just go along with the flow and realize that people love us. Well, I'm a fan myself. That's my major, major endeavor is being a movie buff yes. and a fan of so many things. And so if I could be a movie buff, other people can be movie buffs, including <laughs> liking our films. That's right. Right, right. So let's kind of talk about how you got started, though. I, I mean, you had mentioned already just now that, that you kind of started out being a, a movie buff. But you, even as a small kid, had a fascination with filmmaking, right? I always loved uh, still photography. Then an uncle gave my father an 8mm camera. He passed it on to me, gave me the projector. And I started making little films on 8mm black and white and then buying little home movie films that Castle Films put out. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just was... Uh, a hobby. I loved it, and I started expanding, expanding, expanding. So I have a major archive that I own of tons and tons of films and posters and this and that. And uh, I figured I would be interested in archiving and uh, studying and writing about the hidden byways and highways of the industry, not things that were well known. Uh, nobody needed me to write about Orson Welles or D.W. Griffith. Right. But if I could write about odd things like horror movies that I liked, and uh, when I got in touch with James Warren in 1958, he asked me to write about horror movies, and so I did it. Now, we're talking about the famous Warren, of Warren Publishing, famous Monsters of Filmland, and of course many other uh, magazines, Vampirella and all this and that, and it's kind of like full circle, because I mean, you're not really a monster kid if you don't know anything about famous Monsters of Filmland. 
And uh, you were, as you said, a freelance writer for them for years, right? Well, I uh, started working for Famous Monsters, and uh, Jim Warren is the real editor. Fari Ackerman worked for him. Uh, I started working for him supplying stills, uh, writing articles about horror movies, and then becoming the editor of Wildest Westerns, Screen Thrills Illustrated, and one of the editors of Spacemen. So I did a lot of work for him of all kinds, and Jim Warren at 91 is still a close friend of mine. Wow. wow. Incredible. I got to know Vern Langdon, uh, and I talked about him with, with James Warren. There was a lot of incredible stories. And, and Vern loved to tell a story about how he almost got sued because he put out the, the famous Monsters Mask. But I guess James Warren was a pretty cool dude and, and kind of like loved the whole industry. But I guess from what I understand, not everybody under the Warren label liked Famous Monsters. Of course, they had other magazines. Didn't you have a situation to where somebody from Monty Python actually worked at Warren Publishing and kind of maybe didn't like you and then kind of poked a jab at you when he got into filmmaking himself? Well, it's not quite that. Uh, we had an office on 48th Street, Madison Avenue, in New York, uh, for Warren Enterprises, including uh, Help Magazine, that was kind of an intellectual humor magazine mm -hmm. that Harvey Kurtzman edited <coughs> with Done Mad. And uh, one of his uh, people that worked for him was um, Terry Gilliam, and he had a desk right next to mine, and he was kind of a pseudo intellectual who was making fun of James Warren, myself, Bob Price, uh -huh. Famous Monsters, all those kinds of things. And um, years later, somebody told me he had done a film where he uh, chopped up a Templar knight, much as we did uh, the Frankenstein monster in Dracula vs. Frankenstein. And I've never seen the film, so I can't say he copied our film, but other people have claimed there's more than a casual resemblance to it. <laughs> That's so funny. Right. Now, uh, let's talk about how you uh, tell our listeners how you got involved with Al. I mean, it wasn't Al that you first met, right? It was his father. Well, um, I uh, was a student at the City College of New York Film Institute, a graduate of that. I worked as a film editor and other jobs during college and afterwards. And um, in my collecting of movies, I collected a rare silent movie made in 1928 called The Old Oregon Trail, mm -hmm. which was made by Denver Dixon. That's Al Adamson's father. So I was very anxious to meet Denver Dixon. And on my first trip to L.A. in 1962, uh, through Ed Finney, who was a producer, uh, he got me together with Denver. And I was over at Denver's house, and that's where I met Al. And Al at the time was running a nightclub in the valley called the Mutiny, and he was representing um, uh, girl singers like Tacey Robbins and others, and uh, Vicky Carr actually became quite big. Mm -hmm. And he was not interested in making pictures, but uh, I met him through Denver at the time, and uh, later on when Al wanted to make pictures, uh, Denver said, well, uh, you've got to go back to New York and see Sam Sherman because he's the only one I like and trust in the industry, and that's how it happened. That's incredible. That, that really is incredible. Uh, so when you first met Al, I know you, you were a big fan of his father. His father was a big Western star and everything. Uh, how did he impress you? Because he's, uh, Al Adamson's always been kind of mysterious to me. I, I mean, I never really knew what he was like. Can, can you kind of give us an insight as to what kind of a person and a friend and, and especially well, a business he partner? Came, he came into the house dressed in a black suit, with a white shirt and tie, very formal, and uh, I was wearing a suit and a tie, and in those years, in 1962, when I first went to L.A., uh, everybody wore a suit and a tie. It's just mm. so unbelievable. It was so formal. And uh, Al uh, met me through his father, and he was very formal. He said, well, nice to meet you, Mr. Sherman. Uh, and Denver said, Mr. Sherman is a magazine editor from New York, and he's going to be doing an article on me. Oh, very pleased to meet you. He's very formal and all that kind of nonsense. And uh, uh, years later, Al would go uh, 
to uh, blue jeans and uh, buckskin jackets, and uh, <laughs> they would call me Sambo. It, it was a changed relationship from the formality of our first meeting. But it's funny, when I first came to L.A. in 62, I came out there because I felt my career in New York was going nowhere, and I told my parents, I've got to go to Hollywood. I didn't say L.A. I've got to go to Hollywood. Right. That's where everybody was, everything was. And a lot of my favorite actors, like uh, Bob Livingston, were in Hollywood. And so I wanted to come out there and um, come out to where you folks are now <laughs> and uh, be, be doing something relevant to the industry. And uh, when that happened, uh, I could see the advantages of L.A., all the production was there, everything else was there. And uh, meeting Denver, it gave me a base in L.A., and through the years having Al out there, it gave me a base, and I traveled back and forth. I was one of the early bi-coastal types, New York, L.A. And the funny thing about when I came out there, and I met so many people at major studios, independent, all kinds of people that I met in L.A., they never said, well, this is Mr. Sherman, he's an editor, or he's a filmmaker, or he's this and that. No, uh, this is Sam Sherman. He's from New York. <laughs> that was a mystical, magical expression. He's from New York. And I you know something? Oh. It, it's that way still today. I mean, people's like, oh, my God, you're from New York. You know, <laughs> It's incredible. Well, I don't know what magic we had, but at the time, <laughs> it was the center of the film industry for the world, not L.A., all the head ends of the companies were there, circuits and everybody was in New York, and the networks were here, and everything was here. And uh, it wasn't until maybe the 70s that they began to migrate the change to the West Coast. But because of that, uh, coming from New York, uh, I, the people had a lot of respect for us. Now, I, I still didn't understand that expression. So a couple of weeks ago, when this came up in conversation, I called Jim Warren and I asked his opinion. Uh, I said, Jim, tell me why when I first went out there to L.A., it's, he's from New York, not he works for a magazine company or this and that. Mm -hmm. He said, well, in those years, the 50s, the 60s, New York was the mystical, magical place. Everything was in New York. Every kind of everything. Uh, you had all your major publishers there. All the for magazines and books, all the major printers, some of this, some of that, and in the picture business, everybody was involved with something through television, through promoting movies, through mm -hmm. circuits, through everything. So New York was the place to be, and I was kind of a quintessential born in New York, New Yorker, and uh, kind of a Broadwayite. I was always hanging around Broadway just like uh, the song Broadway Melody. <laughs> I was just real Broadway type, and uh, my offices in the city were generally on Broadway or contiguous with it. Well, it was definitely meant to be that you had his career with, with Al, but I was always surprised that Warren didn't get into making movies. He kind of like always promoted him and stuff, and of course, Forey Ackerman was in quite a few films, but uh, was there any talk of James Warren ever doing a movie with you? or Well, that, that's... That's where uh, <laughs> it led to my trip to L.A. Uh, I was starting a film with Jim, compiled of old silent movies, and um, we went in to do it together. We oh. called it the Screen Thrills movie mm -hmm. for uh, Screen Thrills magazine, and we were working on that and working on it. And uh, one day uh, Jim said we should drive down to Pennsylvania and show it to Shorty Yeaworth. That was Irvin S. Yeaworth, the director of The Blob and Dinosaurs for D-Man. Right. Mm -hmm. And Shorty Yeaworth was a very interesting uh, personality who made religious films. His father had been a minister. And so he uh, knew me, and he was a friend of Jim's. And he looked at what we had, and he decided to deep six me in that thing. Uh -huh. He just said, oh, everything he's done is wrong, and blah, 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 blah. And Jim kind of looked to him as the great director that he was going to fix our film as if something was wrong with it. So Jim and I had a disagreement on that film, and then when I felt that that film was going nowhere, uh, my opinion was, 
I've got to hit the trail for Hollywood, which I did. Right. And that's what led to everything else I did. I'm so glad that thing failed. <laughs> Let me ask you uh, one more thing about Jim's war, Jim Warren. Everybody talks about the relationship between him and Forey Ackman. I know there was kind of a, a riff because Forey Ackman and, and Famous Monsters ran a thing on the Vietnam War, and Jim Warren didn't like that. Were they really friends? I mean, what kind of relationship did Warren and Ackerman have? Well, uh, basically, they started FM together, and Fari was a great fan and a great uh, agent for sci-fi authors, knew a lot about horror films, and uh, Jim was the editor and publisher of the magazine and financed it and owned it. Mm -hmm. But uh, basically, Fari got a credit as editor, everybody thought he edited the books, but Jim had to lay out every page, select every article, put everything in there. And when Fari wasn't giving him everything he wanted, he said, I need you to do this. Fari hasn't done this. I need you to do this. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> this got me in, like, as they used to say, in like Flynn with Jim. And Jim and I became uh, close buddies, which we still are now since 1958. And uh, it just turned out uh, to be good. And yeah, we've had a few disagreements, but who hasn't? But nothing to get yourself crazy over but uh, as I say this film went nowhere and Jim later brought some other people in to try to do something with it and uh, one of them was Woody Allen and Woody Allen uh, he couldn't figure it out but he did like one sequence there where we had a Latin American revolution scene and uh, I was having an announcer narrate it as if it were a sporting event and uh, I've never seen the film Bananas, but somebody tells me that concept turned up in that film. But it, it started with me in this project. And um, so Woody Allen went on to bigger and better things, as we all know. And Shorty Aworth returned the work print to Jim Warren. And he said, you know, Jim, after fooling around with this uh, for some time, and he was um, getting some money out of it, which is always interesting, uh, he said, um, I think it was better the way Sam had it. We should go back to that. Wow. After deep-sixing deep me on the project, <laughs> they killing the whole thing. But, uh, you know, I really didn't want to spend my career doing uh, stock footage paste up movies. But after that, I did do um, a feature called Chaplin's Art of Comedy. Mm -hmm. And that was pretty successful about Charlie Chaplin's early, early career. And uh, it led me on to other things. I had made my own small films, no features or anything prior to that. And uh, when I got together with Al, and Al made his first film, a film which was originally called Echo of Terror, and it then became known as Psycho a Go Go, um, I, I saw in Al great talent, that he was a really good director, and at the time, he had Vilmos Zygmunt as his cameraman, who was just terrific, right. and they shot it in Technicolor and Technoscope, and brought this to New York, and we screened for a lot of people there, all the independent distributors and people like that, and they were amazed at the quality of it. They just couldn't see the marketing of it. That's what they were missing. Yeah, back in so those I days, the, the words psycho and go-go seemed to be quite popular, and, and everybody was doing it. Well, uh... I think we were one of the first ones, but it wasn't us. It was a man by the name of Stanley Darrer, who had a connection to United Artists. He didn't like, he liked the movie Echo of Terror, mm -hmm. but he said it needs some gimmick. Mm -hmm. He came up with Go-Go, and then he felt we should promote the psycho killer who had a small part in the film and enlarge his part. Sal went back, shot the Go-Go numbers and more killing scenes. And by the time we turned around and brought that print back from L.A. to New York, uh, he had lost interest. And he said, no, no, I don't think I'm interested in this. And Al just went back, spent more money, raised more money, and we were stuck with it. So I took it to Hemisphere Pictures. That was a company making war films in the Philippines. And uh, they distributed it for a while unsuccessfully. And uh, we later kept it around on the shelf. And it went through um, a lot of revisions until it became Man with the Synthetic Brain ah. uh, for, a for a company by the name of Allied Artists uh -huh. that um, 
had a big picture by the name of Cabaret, and uh, they wanted it for TV, but they didn't want it for theatrical. So I said, well, uh, we'll put it out. We're going to start our own company. We'll put it out, give it a different name. At the same time it was going on TV, as um, now the synthetic brain, I gave it a theatrical campaign, calling it Blood of Ghastly Horror. Ah. I just made it a very lurid campaign. The picture didn't change any, but the campaign did. And um, that picture, everybody expected nothing to happen with it after all its revisions, and it was being sold to TV by Allied Artists. But we started playing it. It opened at uh, one of the drive-ins in, uh, in uh, let's see, where was it? Somewhere on the East Coast. Uh, it opened to a $19,000 gross, which was tremendous at a drive-in. Uh, they don't do that today. $19,000 gross in a week. So we saw the picture could work, and we took it out nationally. And then we started selling it foreign. And we had a man uh, by the name of Sasson in Argentina who uh, bought a lot of our pictures for Latin America and he got the blood of ghastly horror and he called me up one day he said Sam we really need another film or more films like Blood of Jastly Aurora (laughs) (laughs) Blood of Jastly Aurora I mean it was a reshot mishmash people have criticized that thing for years uh, the original Psycho of Gogo plays a lot better, but that Blood of Jastly or Raw was a mess. But in Latin America, you find a lot of Mexican posters around on that picture. Yeah. That was a big, big hit. And in the rest of the world, played everywhere. Right. You know, at the time when you got together with Al, uh, there were so many different genres, but the biker thing w- was really popular. And, and you guys were at the forefront of making biker films, and a lot of people don't even know this. Satan Sadists. Talk about that and, and problems you had in shooting that and some of the people involved. Uh, I know Russ Hamblin was involved in that, right? Well, what happened was uh, we did not start out to make B pictures. I guess nobody ever does. Yeah. Or C pictures. Nobody ever does. So we had a picture that was set up uh, that we were making for uh, CBA, uh, ABC Network and uh, Cinerama, which was a big company that had had the three-panel uh, big, big uh, show that they put on, uh, big widescreen, the thing, Cinerama process. And they later became just a distributor. And um, this picture was called The Unavenged, And the stars of it were Robert Taylor, Dana Winter, uh, Keenan Wynn, and George Montgomery. And this is going to be shot in Spain as a U.S.-Spanish co-production. But the uh, people in Spain didn't tell us they were having their half of the thing with an Italian company that wanted Raffalone and some other actors in the picture, which ABC wouldn't stand for. And they killed the whole deal. And the the man we work with at ABC was Barry Diller, who was a very big executive oh, yeah. head of Paramount and many other companies. He was at Fox. He, mm-hmm. he has uh, QVC, and he's a billionaire, brilliant guy. And uh, so I worked with him at that time on that. But they had to kill the thing because we were in violation of the contract with this cast change. So Al came back from Spain. Uh, ready to kill himself and he was really upset and I talked to him I said Al forget about these co-productions overseas or making big pictures for big companies we're going to lose control we'll make no money we'll get killed in the process and these people have their own agenda we want to go ahead and make small pictures that we own that we get in a thousand dollars it's ours that we get in five thousand miles from this country or that it's ours and we will be in much better shape. And he said, do I really believe that? I said, yes, I do. We have a number of these pictures. We have a number of these pictures that you've directed already. They're on the shelf, and we could use those. He said, I'll think about it. So he goes to the Edison Hotel on Broadway Mm -hmm. uh, for the night and doesn't tell me what he's going to do, but he takes my title for another picture we had that had been done, 
and he uses that title Satan's Sadist to create the name of the motorcycle gang The Satans and build up this whole story and he calls me the next morning I lived up in the Bronx and he said uh, 7 o'clock he said I wrote a great picture we're going to be out of our hole this is going to be the great thing and blah 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 he, me, he says you got to come down here immediately and take this over to your friend Dan Kennis because he'll back this so I said fine so I dashed down got dressed came downtown to New York uh, picked Al up and we went over to Dan Kennis and uh, Al read him the story uh, which he had told me on the phone I thought it was pretty good and uh, Dan Kennis said it's great Al I will put up the money to make this picture I'm going to back it and uh, I said well what about our plans we told you for this distribution company we needed for this picture and for the ones we've got that are completed and he said I'll back the distribution company too Wow. And so he got friends of his together to back both the making of that one film and the uh, distribution company. Well, when it came to making the film, I said to Al, uh, I really want to put some names in it because otherwise it's just going to look like another cheap amateur film. Right. Uh, what, what we can, who are we going to get? He said, well, I'm going to give you a choice. I know how you hate the idea of shooting a film in 16 millimeter and blowing it up to 35 but this is your choices for the budget we've got which was about $55,000 you want names we've got to shoot it in 16 you want a shot in 35 millimeter no names <laughs> <laughs> so he uh, worked accordingly and uh, he had two names he had worked with that he knew which people were uh, Ken Taylor who was a pretty good actor, and Scott Brady, mm -hmm. he knew them well. And Tamblin had done a picture for Ray Dorn, that's where Al had his office at Hollywood Stages, 6650 Santa Monica. And Ray Dorn had made this picture that had uh, uh, a group of people in it, Russ Tamblin being one of them. And uh, they, they were trying to make a quasi motorcycle picture that had failed. And um, Sal got to Russ Tamlin through Ray Dorn, mm -hmm. and Russ came with the same wardrobe from the earlier picture. Yeah, that's so what he, I he had used it before in a picture called Free Grass, mm -hmm. which was a big failure. So um, he got Russ Tamlin in. Russ Tamlin, at the time, was kind of down in his career, and he embraced the film, and Al let him write dialogue and do all kinds of things, gave him a lot of free reign did an incredible job and the picture just was sensational then to kind of um, add to that I would say enhance that value along came uh, doing a music score now AIP had a number of motorcycle films and the scores were done by Mike Kerb right. who later was in the California government and his group and they had a lot of people there and uh, so we went to meet with Mike Curb, and uh, Mike said, no, I can't do the score for this. I said, oh, God. We wanted Mike Curb, and the Army doesn't want it. He said, I have a comp composer that's pretty good. His name is Harley Hatcher. He's good. And he brought him out. And Harley Hatcher said, well, what's the picture about? He said, uh, he said what about songs? Can we have some songs in this? Oh, yeah, we can have songs and blah, blah, blah. Harley Hatcher did an incredible score and incredible great songs and that really that was the icing on the cake that put that picture over and uh, it ended up having Mercury Records put out a soundtrack album and it was just a great job and when everything was then finished pretty much on the film the film didn't go through any reshooting or changes it was about 9 or 10 days shot straight through no reshooting, no retakes, no anything, no changes, no insert scenes. And um, the only thing we did was my animator in New York, Bob Labar, who did all our opening animated titles. He did a terrific opening title scene to the song I Was Born Mean, which <laughs> sets up the whole plot. Right. And it just was great. Well, apparently there are groups around the world 
who have named themselves Satan Satis or <laughs> Satan, and they do this music. I mean, wow. the music is very popular. You no, know, I what I thought was interesting, Sam, is that we've talked to uh, a lot of directors and producers who make independent film, uh, and and they because they work on a low budget. They very much are kind of like, go with the flow, they'll let things go. There's been many movies that have been horrible or had horrid mistakes in them, and they're just, oh, fine, print, it's fine, just let it go. But what I found interesting about you is that you seem to be a perfectionist. If you didn't like something or didn't like the way it turned out, it got shelved. There was quite a few films that got shelved. Even Dracula vs. Frankenstein was shelved for a yeah, while. Yeah, it's, it's true, but that was not through my effort. That was Dan Kennis who had backed most of that film, uh, which was called The Blood Seekers. And uh, we had the work print uh, sent in from the West Coast to us on the East Coast, and he just hated it. And he said, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. We're just going to shelve it. He had an associate who put up a few bucks with him on that. They said, it's terrible. We're just going to shelve it. Well, I was there, and I felt particularly bad because... Uh, I knew Al felt bad, and he was expecting this thing to be finished, and he'd make some money once it was distributed, but if he didn't distribute it, he'd get nothing. And I was there looking at it, and I'm saying, you know, Danny, uh, I'm of the school of waste not, want not. I can't see putting all this money and time into this thing. And we all worked on this, and then just throwing it away. I said, since you've given up on it, why don't you just give it to me? and I'll see what I can do with it. We had no reason to care. He was just going to write it off. I said, what are you going to do with it? I'm going to change the whole thing, and I'll raise money to fix it and uh, pay you guys off, and you'll be out of it, and forget about it. You know, just be a picture that we use here in some other way. So uh, what did he have to care about that? So I rented a movieola, uh, that was shot in 16 millimeter. I read a 16 millimeter movieola. We only had one in 35 millimeter. That's an editing machine. And uh, so I kept looking at it, looking at it, looking at it. And there was a line in the film that Tony Isley said to Regina. That's Regina Carroll, Al's girlfriend, later wife. Mm -hmm. She was the leading lady in the picture. And mm -hmm. he said, uh, talking about Dr. DeRay, that was played by J. Carroll Nash in the original film. And in the reshoot, he said, well, uh, there's a this kind of an amusement pier with a horror thing down at the shore run by a Dr. DeRay, or at least that's what he calls himself. So I kept watching that. I backed it up, looked at it back. Well, this is what he calls him. Well, if he just calls himself that, maybe something else. What could he be? I'm writing down different things he could be. Ah, oh, maybe he's the last descendant of the Frankensteins and he wants to resurrect the Frankenstein monster as all those people always want to do you know so they tend to do that so um, I came up with that idea I mentioned Al he said it's not bad it's not bad I told to Danny and uh, so I decided let me write this thing so I, I wrote a whole rewrite of the picture threw a lot of the original thing away uh, which had been badly edited by the way the original deal that Al had was with a lab that supplied an amateur kid to edit the picture. I couldn't believe it. Really? Now, once you once you set up your first assembly badly, you're really screwed. I mean, right. it just the thing was really making no sense at all. So I went back to see this kid in L.A. and I said, look, I'm an editor. I, I'll help you do it and all that. And Don't worry. We'll fix it up. And this kid looked at me and he started crying. Seems I have to have that effect on people. <laughs> he just started crying. And I said, what are you crying about? He said, I'm not an editor. I don't know why I was given this job. I can't do it. I'll never be able to. I said, I'll help you. I'll show you what cuts to make. We'll wow, fix it. Oh, my God. No, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. <clears throat> so um, we off went to this guy. And uh, at Al's um, office in the Hollywood stages, there was a... Um, fellow there who was editing and he was an editor by the name of Tony Lonza and uh, he uh, was editing I was asking what he was editing but anytime you walk down the hallway they'd grab you to see his promo reel he was editing a promo reel that he was trying to expand into a feature and Al said 
don't go in there and look at his reel. He's going to try to drag you into it. I said, Al, I don't know what you're so jealous about. Uh, you're, you're part of the company with me. He's not part of the company. I'm, I'm with you. You're with me. Don't yeah. worry about me looking at him. If I want to work with him, he's going to work with us. That's it. So I, I looked at this thing. I said, gee, this is a pretty interesting promo reel. He's got a big, big lumbering guy, and they've got a head put on the side of his head, and um, he's got a little guy on a platform behind him who's kind of stuck his head around, and then from the front they shot it another way. And he cut around this cheat, and he was trying to make a picture, which he eventually completed, called the two-headed transplant. Exactly. I'm going to say that for sure. Yeah, yeah so anyway, I, I felt he was a great editor, could get away with all those cheats he had done in the cutting. So I said, Tony, can I give you a job? And he says, what do you want me to do? I said, oh, this is the story. Al did this picture, and the whole thing was messed up. The first assembly was messed up. You know, everybody knows that. Well, he said, Sam, if your first assembly is messed up, it can never be fixed. You know, like, everybody's telling me what has to be. <laughs> I said, Tony, it has to be fixed. Don't tell me it's not going to be fixed. But I want to hire you. Are you a, an editor for hire? Yeah, I'm an editor for hire. Okay, we're going to give you this whole thing. I want you to fix what you see there. The whole thing that you've got there that's messed up. I'm going to give you the trims and everything else. Fix it the best way you can, and we're going to be reshooting this thing. So that's it. So he fixed it, and I paid him. And I felt that was a major contribution to fixing a kind of a messed up mess and um, then we started, I rewrote it, and we started reshooting it, brought back a lot of the people, and kept reshooting it, and um, I didn't like that cut either, and uh, I threw some of that away, and then uh, we reshot the last 20 minutes in New York, New York State. And my wife knew of a church in Somers, New York, that was very spooky, and so I went up there with her, and shot some 8 millimeter movies of the church and um, there actually were bats in the belfry there <laughs> it was really weird so I said this is a great place Lynn. that's a great pick so um, we decided to go ahead and shoot the ending there and I had a young man who I had sent to film school who wanted to be in the industry another kind of a I call one of my students people come to see me I used to have a screening room and office in my parents' home in the Bronx, and everybody came there looking to screen movies, looking to do things, and a number of people, young people, had no background in anything. I sent mm -hmm. them to the Film Institute, and they had a career, and uh, this was um, a fellow by the name of Paul Glickman, who became a great cameraman. He didn't know what he wanted to be. I said, well, you're going to be something if you want to be in the <laughs> film industry. What do you want to be, a writer, a director, a producer, a cameraman? He said, that sounds good, cameraman. <laughs> so he became a cameraman. And uh, actually, it was uh, Shari Lewis's father. Oh, we really? Knew very well. Holy cow, we yeah. Knew Shari, we knew Shari's family. She was my sister's dancing teacher when she was a kid. <laughs> wow. And, uh, anyway, so we got uh, him to the film school, and I knew him. I said, uh, Paul, you're here. I want you to work on this picture with us in, uh, in New York State. And he did, and uh, Al liked him, and Al used him on a picture for another producer. Sure is he, uh, did a job sure called, is. Um, called Female Bunch. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, Sherry's dad was a uh, magician, too, wasn't he? Uh, yeah, he was a friend of ours. He was... Um, Known as Peter Pan, the Magic Man. There you go. There you go. Well, he, his real name was Abe Hurwitz. He taught at the Yeshiva University in New York, and he um, used to go to all the city schools doing magic. So we all knew him since we were kids, and uh, uh, he lived down the block from me in the Bronx. We, that's how we knew him. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, Paul Glickman shot this whole ending of. Uh, the Dracula versus Frankenstein we know and love of uh, the monster being ripped apart and Dracula deteriorating that whole thing yeah. and uh, we now send it back to the coast and Al had found a new editor 
a man by the name of John Winfield. He was a British editor, and uh, he wanted to give him a try, so we got him in on this thing, and he cut that thing together so well, that ending, and blended all the other footage together we wanted to change and fixed everything up. He did such a great job, and he was our editor for, I don't know, a dozen different films until one day Al said, John Winfield has quit. Oh, I said, what's the matter? Have you been paying him? Of course, I paid him regularly every week. Oh, I hadn't, did you ever have an argument with him? No. We never had an argument at all. He just disappeared. And we could find no trace of him ever working in the industry again or what happened to him. John Winfield, a fantastic editor. And he was the one that took all that uh, silent footage that Paul Glickman shot that Al directed and mm -hmm. I directed the deteriorating scene of uh, Dracula part Al gave up at that point Al said uh, he falls down on the ground that's it he's dead I said no that's not how Dracula dies Al he's got <laughs> to be deteriorated <laughs> that's, that's the that. way he dies you can't do he said well uh, you want to do it you do it any way you want and so we had a bunch of film students there, and they work with me in pouring twigs on uh, Roger's face, who became Xandor, Roger Engel, now Raphael Engel, twigs on his face and dirty makeup and all that sort of thing, until we deteriorated him with a phony uh, skull head that we put on his wardrobe <laughs> and cut that thing so tight. Oh, beautiful. I said to John, I said to John Winfield, that's so phony, it is so bad, but do me a favor, cut it as short as you could, maybe people won't look at it carefully, <laughs> and he did, and it's been on the film ever since, but uh, what I can say is there's a picture saved from the garbage, Yeah. we, we fixed it up, did everything we could with it, and uh, here we are 50 years later, the 50th anniversary of our film. Dracula versus Frank, and it's probably it's the possible. one you're probably the one you're best known for. And I love the fact that we all know that uh, you know Plan Nine from Outer Space. Lugosi died, and they had to get a dentist to play uh, Dracula. Now your Dracula was an accountant, is that right? <laughs> uh, well, he uh, fell to play Dracula. Uh, I thought he was an accountant, but he now says to me that's not true. He worked in a in a record store. Ah. Uh, I guess that. But uh, we knew him for some time. Uh, I met him through Hemisphere Pictures, and he was working on raising money for them with a fellow by the name Mac Johnson, and trying to raise money for us to start our company. And Al felt he looked like Dracula. I wanted John Carradine, and Al said, "No, no, no. We can't afford Carradine. He'll be fifteen hundred dollars a day. We can't pay him that." And we just can't put him in that picture. So let's get Roger, and he'll do it. He'll be fine. No, it was actually. And yet I have. Go ahead. I'm just going to say it was actually Forry Ackerman that came up with his Dracula name, Zandor. Forry and his wife uh, came up with the name uh, from uh, the um, two places: Zandor Levey, the Satanist from San Francisco, yeah, and um, Vorkov, a son of a. An acronym of Karloff, and that's how that came about. Wow. Farian and Wendane, yeah, they yeah. came up with that. Yeah. Now, Roger, I, I guess, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I guess he's still doing well. He kind of disappeared from from the the fan spotlight for a while, and I had read that, that you were letting him know that how much people loved him and loved the character of Xander. He didn't even realize, right? He didn't realize it, and I've been yelling at him for years because I'm still <laughs> friendly with him. Hey, you've got fans out there. They'll pay you to sign photos for them. You go to conventions, this and the other thing. And uh, I've tried and tried and tried, and, you know, hopefully it'll happen. And uh, he did appear in L.A. at the Egyptian Theater where um, David Gregory of Severin Films ran a screening mm -hmm. of the Al and IIP documentary that he did. Uh, I forgot the name of Blood... Blood and Flesh, the life and death of Al Adamson, mm -hmm. something yep. like that. Flesh and Blood, and the ghastly used, life and death of Al Adamson, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, he's used it in his box set, which has been a big sellout of all, all our pictures, which he's upgraded to HD. And um, so um, Raphael, formerly Roger, also known as Zandor, went out there. And uh, he was there, and he talked on the stage at the Egyptian. And the fans came over there and went crazy. They had him autographing photos and everything. But one guy came over to him and he said, I can't believe I'm really meeting you. <laughs> that I'm really seeing you. I never thought this would ever happen. So he was stunned. He just couldn't believe that kind of adoration. But I, I have to say that Al was right in uh, picking Roger over Carradine. He, he we had, had a, Carradine. He had a definite we had look Carradine in different. many. We had Carradine in many pictures. It didn't mean anything. Yeah. Right. But uh, our own Dracula, unique to our film seems to mean something. It definitely had a look, and, and it was different than everybody else. And, and I guess, you know, being born and raised in America, he looked like he came from Transylvania or something. Yeah, he does. He does. But uh, uh, my associate, uh, David Searing, of uh, Drive Insanity Films, is doing so much to organize everything we're doing, the restoration of our films in HD, and running them in drive-ins, which we've been doing during the COVID, and all the different things to help keep our legacy out there, and Al's memory, and all this thing that we keep, we keep doing, uh, it's just amazing, and um, all through this time, it, it proved that uh, Al was right about picking Roger. He just was so right, and Al, Al had an idea, and he said this, he said, I can take an amateur, and if he looks the part, I can make him work. I used to laugh at that, because I was all for <laughs> pro-real actors, film actors, people like that, and Al would say, if they look the part, I can make them work. So he combined the Carradines of this world, the people like that, with the Zandors of this world, people who had never worked, and a lot of other people like that in our films. One film, Nurse Sherry, as a girl that never worked, by the name of Jill Jacobson, she stars as Nurse Sherry, and she was terrific. Al discovered her, and she went on to uh, be on Falcon Crest and a lot of other things. Yeah, how about that? And yeah, Al know, discovered a lot of people. We, you should always try to find a name in a movie, but there's an interesting story with uh, Dracula Frankenstein in, in the fact that you wanted Carradine, and you couldn't afford him and everything, you wound up... You know, not getting him, but you got J. Carroll Nash and you got Lon Chaney uh, Jr. because they had offered them really cheap two for the price of one, but you found out they were in uh, pretty bad health. Well, uh, I wanted uh, Paul Lucas because he talked like Bela Lugosi, <laughs> and I thought he'd be great in a horror film. So I was talking with him on the phone for a number of weeks sent them the original script of the blood seekers and he, he said let me read the script Sam. and i said well uh, i just saw you on a show for universal and you had a great hair piece because he was bald he didn't have a hair piece normally and uh, i want him to look younger and i said do you have that hair piece uh that you used on the universal show he says oh that's not my hair sam that's Universal's hair. <laughs> you want me to have hair in your picture? You've got to go to Max Factor and get me hair. Yeah. So I sent the script to Paul Lucas, and Paul Lucas read. He called me back. He says, Sam, I can't do this film. And sounding exactly like Bela Lugosi, he said to me, it's entirely too bloody. Oh, my God. <laughs> and he wouldn't do it. So the next one was Francis Lederer, who had done The Return of Dracula. And he had a European accent, but he was a banker in Canoga Park, and he was going to a convention in D.C., so he couldn't do the part. So, you know, Al saying, we got to shoot, we got a date, we got to shoot. So he went to his agent, Jerry Rosen, and Jerry Rosen offered him, uh, for one week, uh, Cheney Jr. and uh, J. Carroll Nash, the both of them, for $6,000. Mm -hmm. And he said, how can we turn that down? Well... We should have turned it down, or maybe we shouldn't, I don't know. But Al never met them. I never met them. We didn't know that Cheney was dying of throat cancer mm -hmm. and he couldn't talk, or couldn't talk audibly, and that uh, 
uh, Nash had a bad eye and he was weak maybe had a stroke uh, so Al had to make do with those two the best way he could I cut out all the dialogue of of uh, Cheney from the film I said no I can't use this it's too pathetic and so we cut it all out and made him mute and um, as a matter of fact I did the same thing in another film I did a film on the east coast called Raiders of the Living Dead and we had an actor that was just really awful no matter what we did he just got worse and worse so I decided to get him in a situation where he'd be electrocuted <laughs> and be dead and then bring him back from the dead and at the time we did that he then couldn't talk Ingenious. so we did it twice but uh, I also felt that um, Roger or Xandor would be a lot more weird if I put his voice into reverb Yeah. so he's the only one in the picture that has that and uh, people liked it I thought it was kind of stupid but I felt it would give him a presence that uh, would add to his part did, did I hear you say something about that, that uh, Al did a commercial with Cheney Jr. Uh, anti-smoking commercial that was never released yeah they did it on the picture uh, the uh, uh, female bunch but I've never seen it I don't know if they ever finished it I know that that uh, somebody who did a thing like that who was dying was Yule Brenner. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what can I say? Well, One way or the other. Too, too bad about their health. Their I know you had problems with, with Nash because he could walk, but you had him in a wheelchair. And I hear that he couldn't really maneuver the chair very well, and you was worried that he was going to turn around and run the chair into the electric equipment because you had all the original Frankenstein gear from uh, Strict Baden. Well, it's kind of strange. It's really weird. I'm always using that expression. It's really <laughs> I love weird. It. It's a good uh, word. Yeah, it's, it's really weird. We've chalked off the set for Nash and told him, Mr. Nash, stay within the chalk lines, please. <laughs> don't chalk. Don't don't uh, don't wheel over <clears throat> to where the uh, knife switches are. Please stay away from it. And I'm telling Al, I said, Al, I don't want to be the one that electrocutes J. Carol Nash on a movie set. <laughs> no. To keep him away. So every time he's going towards those knife switches and open contact, I'll say, Mr. Nash, please go over there. We'll follow the chalk lines. And <laughs> so that's what went on during that shooting. <clears throat> now, years later, years later, I got to see the first Batman serial. Oh, yeah called The Batman, in which J. Carroll Nash plays the main heavy, Dr. Daka. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And he's got all of those strict bad machines, and he's got that whole knife switch board, and he's using them to create zombies in the movie. <laughs> he was the only one on our set that no knew how to use that. <laughs> oh, my God. And I'm preventing him from using it. Oh. <laughs> That's incredible. Did, did you have any problems with Cheney drinking? Because I heard he, he drank very good. Uh, no, because the kind of part he played, it was just fine. It didn't, yeah. didn't affect his part at all. Right. It was enough for a pro that he could drink and lie down and take a nap. And when Al wanted him, he'd pop right up again. Right. Well, I know you loved Abbott and Costello and me Frankenstein, but your film, Dracula Frankenstein, uh, is, is my favorite meets film of all the films <laughs> that were ever made where somebody met somebody. And well, definitely thank, you because it, thank you, because it was influenced by... Uh, Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein, which was the, one of the first horror pictures I saw. Actually, the first horror picture I saw was an art film. My mother was the assistant principal and highly cultural lady, lived to 105. Yeah. And she took me to see a picture, which was a famous French art film, La Belle et la Bête, Beauty and the Beast. Oh, yeah. Wow, and it, yes. it had, the beast was like a werewolf. It really frightened mm -hmm. me. So that was the first horror-type thing I ever saw, and then Dracula versus Frankenstein, but also was the first picture I ever saw with Lugosi in it, who I just loved. I feared him, but I loved him. Right. Well, when we had the owner of Severn Films on, I told him that, that your movie was 
the greatest film ever made. He started laughing for about 10, 15 minutes, but he realized, <laughs> <laughs> he realized how, much, how much I loved it. Well, I wanted to ask you, uh, Sam, uh, I think it's to talk a little bit about David Searing and talk about how you got, how you met him, how you got involved with working <clears throat> with him, because, of course, he just had one of these, these big blood rama screenings in Scranton, Pennsylvania last night, and I think it's very interesting and fantastic that he is working to keep the films alive and doing all this because if you want to talk about old school, if you want to talk about somebody who has in their heart the kind of cult movie love and B-movie love, it's definitely David Searing. David Searing is one of the major executives of the media industry. He was one of the heads of AMC Network, and that's where I know him from. I know him many years, and he is a great fan of horror cult, Al Adams and myself, our films, the Hemisphere Blood Island films, all these things and he wanted to work with me on all these things and I said let's do it and whatever David does is great, he does great promotions, brings in fabulous artists to do new artwork and work with uh, David Gregory at Severin Films to do all the HD versions of our pictures here that these up, upgraded I mean it's just uh, I have great pleasure working with him I talk to him every day well you know and, I, I uh, was one of the original subscribers to the, the boom service with satellite dish and I got Monsters HD and when Monsters HD and the boom satellite service disappeared I cried I just <laughs> love that channel and his work on there was so incredible well then you saw the short documentary they did with me yes. mm -hmm. about Dracula versus Frankenstein. Yes, yes absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, I was down there at their studio. Yeah, I think that uh, when David ran AMC, uh, he he really had a great channel. I I loved that channel. I loved everything about it. They they just did such a great job with everything, and all of a sudden they decided to change you know, how executives work they change things and it uh, lost its cult flavor for yeah. us yeah. cult fans and, and now we got Shutter which is like a poor comparison I mean it's not anything like Monsters HD but I love what you did last night with, with the, the drive-in because you've got Dracula rings and you've got <laughs> Dracula fangs and the iron on and everything that's incredible that's old school you guys are so now Amazing. Co correct me if I'm wrong, Sam, but the the way that we actually ended up getting in touch with you was through David Searing because we were working with Brian Usna to promote the uh, the GoFundMe Kickstarter that they were doing for the Blood Island project. Now, are you, am I correct in understanding that you're the one that owns the Blood Island films at the the originals? Yeah, I, my company is the owner of those films, but I've licensed certain rights to David Searing, and uh, I uh, assist him in any way he needs on those projects, and uh, I think he does a great job with them, and I'm hopeful that will happen. Uh, Brian Houston is a great filmmaker, and it's a great combination. Now, I've got to ask you, because I, I saw the Severin documentary on Al. And they were talking to you because you were putting together a UFO documentary on aliens from space, and you've got a lot of footage that you've shot that's never been released and never been put together. And there was a part of your interview to where you acted very strange and acted like you were afraid to talk about it. What was that all about? Well, um... You scared the shit out of me when you did that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, it's by... You know, you're asking a good question. Uh, it deserves to be spoken about. And I could say, yes, I've been witness to uh, things that are very peculiar, that are inexplicable. Uh, yes, we filmed things like that. I was involved with uh, that study. And uh, Al uh, started with me on that uh, way back when I had... Uh, seen and photographed a UFO in the Bronx in 1961 and um, it indicated to me that there really there really were such things um, and uh, once I knew that there were such things I found I was submitted to a lot of ridicule uh, and I'm a very serious person I like to kid around but I'm basically very serious and yeah. I didn't like being ridiculed but 
um, as I got involved with Al after 1961, and he was visiting me at my house, we were looking around through telescopes up in the air and seeing strange lighted things flying around. He remembered that. And in 1967, I came up with the idea of doing a UFO documentary. So we talked about it, and I said, yeah, I remember when I was at your house, I saw those things flying around and all that. And he said, okay, let's see what we can do. So we started talking about it in 67. And um, then I said, you know, I think I really don't want to do this now. I really want to continue doing what we're doing with dramatic films, not documentaries. Not that it's about UFOs particularly, but documentaries versus dramatic films. So we didn't do any documentaries. But now the time moved on. In 92, Al's wife, Regina, passed away. And Al was very, very upset. Sure. He just was very beside himself. And uh, I uh, came up with the idea of going back to that UFO documentary idea. So I, I called him up to try to get him to be proactive, get his mind off his, his unhappiness. And he said, yeah, I'll work on it. Whatever you want me to do. But he said, uh, I, I don't believe it. I'll shoot reenactments and uh, just dramatize them. I, I don't want to. I don't believe it. So he started with, I don't believe it. And he ended up going to Australia twice, filming a lot of things there. Went to Italy once, filming there. Worked on a reenactment that he filmed in Texas. He was quite involved with the project. And we had other groups filming in other areas. And um, we were doing various things. But somehow Al got to be very proactive about the film, which he wasn't at the beginning. He didn't believe in it and everything. And then he got to be uh, very strong on strange things he wanted me to follow and places we were going to go. And uh, around that period, he disappeared. Mm. And uh, I had called me last from Texas where he was looking into real estate that was one of his businesses and uh, I never spoke to him again he he was saying I'm going back to my house in Indio and uh, disappeared off the face of the earth there was a man working on the property there so Al's not here he hasn't come back Al's not here and it just turned out to be the guy working on the property that murdered him yeah. and uh, it just was a great great uh what should I say? I was like the brother I never had, and to hear that he was murdered, it just was. It just threw me for a loop. Let, let me ask I, you I a really crazy. Couldn't touch that film. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me ask you a crazy question. Going off the deep end here, and I don't want to like get mm -hmm. into conspiracy theories or whatever. I do believe in alien life. Okay, and, and I've seen things too. But do you think? that Al's death was just because he had this crazy contractor working for him? Or do you think there might have been some kind of a connection to where he was off by a contractor because he knew something he wasn't supposed to know in this UFO research? Well, I'd have to say I worked with the police on this investigation for a number of months. I could see no connection to the UFO world, okay. to Al's death and I've thought about it for years I've had time to think about it and I can see no direct connection yeah people have thought that there was an article in the LA Weekly big issue with Al on the cover artwork and all that leading to the murder and then it said uh, in the body of the article Sam Sherman said that aliens killed Al <laughs> and so I complained to them bitterly. I said, yeah. I never said it in any interview or, or any other time. I never even thought that. And so they they retracted it like three months later in the back of a little tiny thing that nobody ever read. So I, I just couldn't see the connection to that. Or why would aliens care one way or the other that Al was working on reenactment footage in a documentary when there have been so many feature documentaries about UFOs and TV shows and 
books and magazines of this value. Why pick Al out and murder him? You yeah. know what I mean? Right. right. Do, do you think you'll ever uh, put that together and release it? I don't know. I certainly lost my enthusiasm for it. I will tell you that. And uh, it seemed like anybody I ever talked to about it to try to help me resurrect it or finance the changing of it, they seemed to all lose interest. I couldn't find people that wanted to, to work with me on the thing. Well, you definitely had a psychic connection with Al. Uh, you had to have been close like a brother because you even had an intuition that something happened to him. The word cement showed up in your mind, right? I mean, you kept thinking of the word cement for some reason. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I was just telling that to somebody the other day. Yeah, it is true. And... Uh, I, I, yeah, I was very close to Al, and uh, he was just a great, great guy and a fun person, and we got along really well. And his wife and my daughter and my wife, all like family, we got along so great, and uh, we love working on projects together. And uh, Regina was a great, great gal. She was a lot of fun, and it's interesting. Uh, she was once interviewed by somebody who said, well, Regina, what's Sam Sherman like? Well, you never hear what somebody else thinks about you. And right. Regina said, Sam Sherman, he's always work, 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 go, 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 fun, 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 always <laughs> getting around. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, as we, as we kind of get ready to wrap this up, Sam, I wanted to ask you how you feel about your legacy and, and do you feel like you were typecast because I mean really of course everybody always talks about Dracula versus Frankenstein but there were so many great films that you guys did and you really touched every genre I mean with the stewardess movies you kind of did the, the sexploitation comedy things you did the bikers films not only with Satan Sadist but Angels Wild Women what is your favorite what genre is your favorite and do you feel like you you know damn it I should have been known more for this one which one is the Lost gem. Well, let me say let me say this that we were running a business, so that's what influenced everything. Uh, my favorite film is Blazing Stewardesses, which had my favorite actor in one of the leads, Bob Livingston, mm -hmm. also Don Red Barry, the Ritz Brothers, Yvonne DiCarlo, and uh, I had a lot of fun working on that picture. And Al even forced me into a role in it. <laughs> right. And uh, you know, like anything else. Uh, you know, you like things because you had good memories on it. There were a lot of fun times we had on that picture. And as far as my career goes, I put it in my book, When Dracula Met Frankenstein, and people can pick that up through Amazon. It's all over the place, and they seem to be enjoying it. There are like a dozen or more good reviews on Amazon. I couldn't believe it, but they're you know, very well-spoken uh, reviews that people like. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, my thought about my career, uh, as separate from Al, I have to write another book to explain that. I mean, I've done so many other things mm -hmm. beyond what's in this particular book or beyond what involved Al and myself. Things that happened before, things that happened during, things that happened after. Right. But um, I felt... Uh, people wanted to know more about Al, how Al and myself worked together, about the company, about things we did. And that um, my editor, uh, Tim Ferranti, uh, is what he calls that book IIP centric. He says this is not your autobiography; it's IIP. So based on that, a lot of things, other things were cut right. that are not in the book, but. Um, as far as what I wanted to do, yeah, a lot of things I wanted to do, I like to do romantic comedies, uh, you know, and uh, that's not in the book here, and uh, <laughs> it's not anything I've made. I like to do like a two or three character play as a movie, a short kind of thing, and there are other things I want to do. I still want to do, uh, I want to do a Broadway show and movie based on the life of Bob Hope oh, and wow. go to Bob Hope's uh, daughter and uh, get her to cooperate with this and I want to have um, in it um, Kelsey Grammer who looks so much like Bob Hope who loves Bob Hope and uh, I'd like to help produce that and put Perfect. that together 
I, I just really, to me, I love Bob Hope, and I watch all the DVDs of Bob Hope and the road pictures and everything. And that's the kind of thing I like, and uh, I don't know if I'll ever have that opportunity, but at least you know, I keep mentioning it to people. You know, I'd like to do that. But um, I like romantic comedies. I like uh, a lot of famous pictures that have been done. Um, uh, the Awful Truth with Cary Grant mm -hmm. and Irene Dunn, things like that. I mean, I, as far as far from what I have done as possible, <laughs> and uh, you know, maybe I'd never have that opportunity. But the point of the matter is, young people today don't get the opportunities I had. It was a different era where you could do things and you could, you know, go out and take a chance or. John Wayne was in a movie called um, In Old Oklahoma uh, dealing with oil development and Sidney Blackmer played uh, Teddy Roosevelt and John Wayne came in to see him and said Mr. President I'd like an opportunity for a man to take a chance and he said to him uh, President Roosevelt said back to John Wayne he said Oh, that's pretty good, my young man. You want an opportunity for a man to get a chance to take a chance. <laughs> he wanted to, to be a wildcat oil well guy. And that's what I had. And never thought of it tied in with John Wayne, who I knew, by the way. Uh, the fact that that was there, that there was somebody who wanted to do something, wanted an opportunity to do something. I want to see young people, young filmmakers today, get an opportunity, even though I know they don't have the opportunities I had. I could go out and do any crazy thing. I worked for Hemisphere Pictures, and uh, they had a picture called Mad Doctor of Blood Island mm -hmm. I was involved with working for them. And Kane Lynn, who was the producer of the picture, said, Sammy, the gimmick is green blood. I want you to come <laughs> up with green blood. And so I did the oath of green blood. Yes, you did. Yes. People love that. That's the craziest thing. And I know that it, it did get performed in at least one theater in St. Louis, in a big Lowe's theater. They actually stood up and read the oath of green blood and, and took that stuff, which when I tasted it, gave me an upset stomach. <laughs> but uh, and there it was. I mean, these opportunities were great, or the fact that I could go ahead and get to be a friend of Sumner Redstone, big exhibitor who turned out to be the biggest executive in our industry, he had a Paramount, CBS, and this, that, and the other. Who has these opportunities today? They don't have them. Mm -hmm. They're not there. And the industry has, has kind of contracted. And young people, if they don't know somebody, they don't get anywhere. I didn't know anybody. My mother was an assistant principal. My father was a pharmacist. I shouldn't say he didn't know anybody, because he did know uh, a big producer at Fox who was a friend of his, but I was never sent there, so nothing happened with that. Right. But um, the point I'm getting to is that they always say, well, in our industry, it's important that you've got to know somebody to get in there or be related to someone. I had no contact. I'm a kid in the Bronx at the age of seven going by myself three blocks to a theater paying for it for 14 cents going to see movies I was what you call movie crazy right. I was media crazy collected comic books, listened to radio shows, watched horror this and horror that and western this and western that and all that sort of thing And I make up my mind I'm going to Hollywood and I'm going to bring Bob Livingston back Everybody thought I was nuts. <laughs> I ended up bringing Bob Livingston back. Mm -hmm. He wasn't working. Well, uh, you know, these things and all the other people I loved. Of course, Lugosi was gone, but Carradine was there. And I did meet uh, Boris Karloff and had so many opportunities that came my way. James Warren and a lot of other things that just were amazing. And uh, 
Um, a, lot, a lot of that's in the book. It's not all in the book. but You, you know, you certainly to... made your mark, and you certainly are legendary. But a lot of times when people talk about B-movies and history and cult films and drive-in films and all that stuff, of course, the name they always come up with is, is a Roger Corman. Sometimes I'll mention Nicholson, Arkoff. Does it upset you that although you guys were legendary, you and Alan, you certainly made a mark, that maybe some people doesn't put you in, in the same esteem as they talk about, oh, Corman, the king of the drive-in. Are you upset that they don't often think of you guys as king of the drive-ins when you guys deserve to be there just as damn much? Well, uh, Roger Corman is a terrific filmmaker. He's a terrific conceptual developer. We took a lot of ideas from him. I, I know him for many years, and I made some uh, business uh, deals with him. Some mm -hmm. are in the book, some are not. But uh, Roger's a terrific guy. Oh, yeah. He's yeah. Uh, achieved so much and influenced so many of us. And I would say uh, uh, Sam Arkoff wouldn't have existed without Roger. Sure. Uh, Jim Nicholson wouldn't have existed without Roger. Roger's just a great, great guy. And, yes, he's very important. And in the running of the company, certainly uh, Sam Arkoff, who I knew, I did not know, Jim Nicholson, but Jim Warren knew him well, uh, and he died unfortunately too young. Yeah. Uh, Jim Nicholson, but yeah, I, I would say that we're all part of the same industry. And if you're talking to me, I don't really care about my own career. I've never had a website about myself or my company. I've never gone out and promoted myself. Talking to you folks tonight, mentioning the book and some of these other things. It's the closest I've come to promoting anything, but I generally do not promote myself because I'm not comfortable doing it. Someone once said, self-promotion is no promotion, <laughs> but Fari Ackerman didn't believe that. Right. Yes. He was out promoting himself 24-7. Yes, he was. <laughs> but Fari was a great friend of mine, and uh, we were very close with him and Wendy, and... Uh, Linda and Stephanie, it's my daughter Stephanie and my wife Linda, we would come out to the coast, we'd see them. If they came to New York, we'd see them. We'd go out to dinner, we'd just stand the other thing. You know, I'd say, I'll tell you what I like, and I'm not going to cry about Al's death. I've done that already. Um, I would say I'm happy for the friends I've had. Yeah. I've had great friends, both actors, people I've worked with, partner like Al Adamson, Dan Kennis. Erwin Pizer, Kane Lynn at Hemisphere, Eddie Romero, all these great people that I've had a chance, especially Bob Livingston, my favorite actor, and son Addison's a good friend of mine. Uh, I mean, all these great people I've been able to touch, rub elbows with, and join with them in career things and stuff I've done. I'm thrilled I've had that opportunity, the little kid in the Bronx, watching all these old movies and wanting to be part of Hollywood. Part of Hollywood. Go and I said that to my parents. I <laughs> said, I've got to go to Hollywood. My career's going nowhere. And my mother said, Well, you know, you should go back to college and you could teach your good at this, that and the other thing and I said, No, I don't want to do that. I want to go to Hollywood and make films. That's what I want to do. Before I ever met Al I want to go to Hollywood. I've got to go there. And my father said, I think he's right. We're going to back him. We're going to back you, and you're going to go out there. <laughs> and that's it. I'd never gone anywhere in my life. Mm -hmm. At the age of 22, I didn't even have a driver's license. One, two, three, I was on a plane, never flew anywhere, on my way to Hollywood. And there it happened. And it's all in the book. And, and, and you're lucky enough that you sound like you have health. You're, you're with it. I mean, you remember everything. We get actors on. It's only been around for five, ten years. They don't remember what they did yesterday. <laughs> and you're, you're like an encyclopedia. You, you've really got it all together. Being at your age, you're like you're a 25-year-old guy. Seriously, talking to one. Well, my mother lived to 105. Wow. She was the archivist for the family. Relatives came from all over the country to meet her and film her and question her about this one and that one and all that sort of thing. And, uh, yeah, I have a good memory. A lot of things I remember. And as a matter of fact, I will tell you that that book, When Dracula Met Frankenstein, 
is all written from my memory. Yeah. Wow. Some things I dictated, some things I wrote on my computer, but it's all written from my memory. I didn't go to say, well, let me research this. On this date, what <laughs> happened there? What happened? No. But what's not in the book is my six or seven meetings with John Wayne. Yeah. How yeah. I got to know John Wayne. That's a great story. And uh, I'm, I've been thinking to myself, yeah, I should have I should have pushed uh, to do more with John Wayne. But when I came to L.A., I should have gone to see him and helped him with something he needed some help with. And maybe he would have wanted me to work for him on something. But I liked him a lot. And he was just a great guy. And he would see me, like, standing at a premiere of a film. And he'd look at me, see me. He said, Hiya, kid. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> he was the greatest great. American in history. I mean, he really was incredible. Wow. Are, are yeah, you just great? Just great. Are now, you, I wanted to let uh, our listeners know because we have a, a lot of horror movie fans that if you haven't. Uh, been convinced already enough to check out Sam's book because of the amazing stories. Uh, you, your foreword is actually also written by another uh, staple in the horror community. That's John A. Russo, right? Uh, Jack Russo, yeah, it's one of my best friends. He's just a great guy. I work with him on several films and got to know him real well. And every time he'd come to the East Coast to go to Chiller Theater, I'd always come to sit at his booth with him and Russ Dreiner. And I always had so much fun with him, and he's just a great, great guy. And we've tried to do several pictures that have never been done. He wrote a, a picture for me called The Black Cat. I, I don't know what happened to that. I can't even find the script or anything on it. Mm. But maybe he'd want to do it sometime. And Russ Striner is great, and uh, Russ's brother, Gary Striner. And one night they took me down to a comedy club in the village. Russ and Gary and Jack had such fun with that comedy club <laughs> going there, and they treated us to dinner and everything. I I'll tell you something: the thing I like is having fun, yeah. and that's that's. Uh, I am a hard worker. When I have to do a project, I'll work my butt off, but I enjoy having fun. And when we had the two surviving Ritz brothers on the last shoot of. Uh, of uh, Blazing Stewart. Right, and they're crowded. They were always playing tricks on me. <laughs> they were always playing. I'm taking pictures all the time. I'm a big still photographer. I'm looking down into my Roloflex and looking straight ahead. And one goes off to the right, one goes off to the left, and there's nobody in the frame. <laughs> it's so funny. And they would tell you things. And Harry, he was so obscene. He was so obscene. He had such <laughs> great obscene stories. Tell me the story about how he would uh, be working as a cleanup guy, sweeping as a young man in a gynecologist's office. And I'm keeping this clean for broadcast. No, right? go ahead. We're uncensored. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, uh, it's nothing too bad. But anyway, and some woman came in for a gynecological exam. And he had her get up on the table and you know, undress and put her foot in the stirrups. And he started examining her. He was just the guy sweeping up the <laughs> office. <laughs> Harry Ritz. Oh, my God. Oh. The stories that he told. And he told stories like that about well-known actors and people that, oh, God. Anytime I was with him, I was just in hysterics. It just everything that he did was so funny and um, uh, it was just a it was a great opportunity because I realized that um, I had written a comedic version of that movie with Jim Warren and I had a lot of funny things in it and I never got to do comedy really mm. but there were little comedic things of Blazing Stewardesses mm -hmm. not necessarily what I was writing but some of the things that uh, happened with the, the Ritz brothers was so funny, but actually I started that picture wanting to bring the Three Stooges back. Yeah, and I had uh, Mo Howard and Larry Fine that had a stroke. He was at uh, the motion picture home, but still he was going to work in the picture in a wheelchair. And um, then we had um, uh, uh, let's see, 
uh, Curly Joe Dorita, mm -hmm. uh, not the original Curly, yeah. but he was in the later Stooges. And um, so we wrote a whole script for them, and uh, they were going to be running the health club at this Western Dude Ranch, and Regina Carroll was not a stewardess in that version. She was going to be a, a victim con uh, coming down for a beauty treatment, and they ended up uh, shaving her hair off. It was just so funny. And then they were then to make up for it, they were they were going ahead and putting shoe polish over her head oh to gosh. darken it where they had shaved the hair off. And then they had another thing that they did. Uh, that was written by me, that part. But the rest of it was a rubber leg that came up through the bottom of an exercise table, a massage table, and um, her leg went down into the table, but this rubber leg came up, and they covered it with a, uh, with a kind of a cloth. And now they went ahead to massage her leg, and they started twisting the rubber legs. <laughs> and Mo was doing it a little more. We're just going to turn this a little more. <laughs> and they had turned that leg 360 degrees three or four times. And she was moaning and groaning. And I'm saying, this is funny. Yes. Well, unfortunately, unfortunately, Mo had to go to a doctor. He was sick and he was dying of cancer. He didn't know it. And I said, Mo, can't we do this some way? Can't we come to your house and shoot you on the phone? You'll phone in the part with the other guys. They'll be down at the ranch. And he said, Sammy, you know I don't need the money. And he said, uh, you know, the only reason I'm doing this picture is because you love us so much. And I love you for loving us. And, oh, oh I'm talking to Mo and no, he's dying. And he's telling me why he can't be in us. We're both crying on the phone. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, oh, my God, this is a moment that might have happened. And then I, I spent like a month at the Sheraton Universal trying to get other people until we finally got the two Ritz brothers. But I can't say it wasn't great because it was great with them. But Three Stooges are still archival in their significance. You know what I'm saying about right. that. Absolutely. And, and that's Absolutely. why you're so great. You've got such a love of, of old Hollywood and, and, and these old actors and everything. And, and I don't know. What, what more can I say about you except thank you for everything that you and uh, Al have done. And, and I hope that you do more. Are you going to yeah. be involved in the, uh, the reboot uh, where they did the Kickstarter for the Blood Island thing? Are you involved with Brian Hughes now? now no, or? only to the extent that David wants me in it. If he needs me for something, I, I will do it. But, uh, you know, I, what I would really like to do is this Bob Hope project. Yes, yes. yes. It's, it's only a project in my mind, and it's a project in the fact that I've invested in so many DVDs and books and things like that, and I love Bob Hope. I think he's so funny and so great, and... Uh, I just would love to do that, and I think Kelsey Grammer is such a great actor, and he he just looks like Bob Hope, right? And he did buttons and bows on Frasier. Oh my God, is that funny? <laughs> well, Sam, I want to thank you so much for joining us. I I do hope that you write a second book that goes far past just IIP centric, and but for right now, all of our listeners can absolutely and should absolutely pick up a copy of the book and the soundtrack album and the yeah. soundtrack album yeah we're going to talk about that after the interview because the soundtrack for Mad Doctor of uh, Blood Island and Dracula vs. Frankenstein was just released on vinyl uh, again so we're, we're going to talk about that in a minute uh, after the interview but for and you know you know what they say don't hmm. you what's that the decision is vinyl <laughs> <laughs> Very true. And, Very and true. vinyl has a comeback, just like because of COVID, the driving had a comeback. And That's you guys right. were right there right. with your screen. You just had one last night, and I hope you continue those two. I want. But in the meantime, everybody should pick up the book in yes. case you didn't write it down or you know you're old and you don't remember. The name of the book is When Dracula Met Frankenstein. The full title is When Dracula Met Frankenstein: My Years Making Drive-In Movies with Al Adamson. It came out in July. You can pick it up on Amazon um, or anywhere where you know you can get books online. Fantastic, fantastic book. 378 pages. Forward by John A. Russo. So definitely pick up a copy. Well, thank you so much, and I've enjoyed our little uh, visit and chat. And uh, 
thank you for your kind words about our career and the book and everything. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sam. It has been such a pleasure to chat with you. Yep. My pleasure. All right. Continue success with what you're doing. Thank you. Absolutely. And I really hope the Bob Hope Project gets off the ground. That would be great. Thank you. All Take right. care now. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.